Hello everyone, and welcome to Uncivil Law, where we learn through the misfortunes of others. If you're enjoying our legal education content, please remember to subscribe. It helps our channel grow. For today's case, we're dealing with a situation where the police basically wrecked a mobile home in part of an arrest of a guy who wasn't even there. This comes courtesy of the Supreme Court of the state of South Dakota and is Gareth Harmon versus Hamlin County. The police were after a guy. They came to his mobile home. They had reason to think he wasn't there. They basically, they basically uh, tore apart the house and they would like to sue for damages. So can we get any recovery for what the police did to this mobile home? Let's get started with this. In 2016, the sheriff and Waterton police detectives stopped at the Harmon residence near Castlewood, South Dakota. They were looking for Gareth's son, Gary, who had an outstanding arrest warrant for felony burglary and misdemeanor violations of a protection order. The police reports indicated that earlier that morning, Gary had threatened to shoot himself and anyone he came in contact with. So the police are looking for Gary, who has an arrest warrant, and they're worried about his safety and safety to others. Okay. Gary called Gareth while law enforcement was still at Gareth's house. The officers could overhear the conversation. Gary asked Gareth to pick him up in the car because law enforcement was looking for him, and he stated that he needed a car to go to Canada or Mexico. So he's looking to flee the jurisdiction. I would, I would assume Canada would be a lot easier given that you're in South Dakota, but you know, what do I know? Gareth did not tell Gary that the officers were present. Gareth asked Gary where he was and Gary replied that he was at his mobile home. So now the police have a fix on him. He's at his mobile home. So the police are going to go there. The police arrived on the scene and set up a loose perimeter around the home. However, law enforcement was unable to monitor all four sides of the home because there was some forest and stuff. So they were only able to monitor some of the home and not all of it. So someone could theoretically get out of the home and leave. When the SWAT team attempted to contact Gary, officers received a report that a local resident had observed Gary running up towards Castlewood. The resident reported that Gary came out of a tree line near a river and sewage pond, but he had run back up into the trees. Meanwhile, the sheriff had spoke with Gary's brother-in-law, Tim. Tim told the sheriff that Gary had a gun in a holster under his arm, but he did not see any other guns. The special response team arrived. The special response, response team brought in a second armored vehicle to clear the shelter belt in search of Gary. During the search, the search response, the special response team located a super suitcase containing mail clothes, a bag with needles, a cell phone, and an empty gun case. The sheriff believed the suitcase confirmed that Gary was armed and possibly using illegal substances. So this was, this was his go bag in the form of a suitcase. So, okay. Not long after, the sheriff authorized SWAT and the special response team to breach the doors and windows of the mobile home. According to the affidavit, the tactical procedure to secure the mobile home is to create communication portholes in an attempt to call out any subject or subjects that may be hiding inside. If unsuccessful, gas munitions are used to flush out anyone inside. To create communication problems, portholes for the trailer, an armored vehicle pulled away the front stairs and deck, which were not attached to the mobile home or secured to the ground, and pushed in the front door with a ram. That would be one way to create a hole, to push in the door of the mobile trailer with a ram. That'd do it. The second armored vehicle opened three portholes on the opposite side of the mobile home by breaking through the windows and a sliding patio door, causing significant damage to the walls and the septic system. The Hammonds filed a complaint against the police for inverse condemnation under the South Dakota Constitution and claims under 42 U.S.C. 1983. The Hammonds claimed the damage caused by the armored vehicle totaled $18,778.61. All right, so the police come looking for this guy. They believe he's armed and dangerous. There's some evidence to support that conclusion. Um, he's wanted on arrest warrants, and they believe he's at his mobile home. So they go to his mobile home. They have a report that he might not be in his mobile home, though, because a neighbor saw him running towards the city. Um, but the, at some point, the police decide to breach into the home. And so they do. And they cause 18000 and change worth of damage to the mobile home. Because, you know, armored vehicle versus mobile home. How do you think that's going to work? Armored vehicle wins would be the answer to that one. So, yeah, they, they ha the Hammonds are sad about the damage to the mobile home because no one was in there, so they didn't need to do this, so yeah. 
The Hammonds assert a claim for inverse condemnation, arguing they're entitled to compensation under the damages clause of Article 6, Section 13 of the South Dakota Constitution, which provides that private property shall not be taken for public use or damaged without just compensation. So the South Dakota Constitution goes a little bit further than the U.S. Constitution. It also allows for, it also prevents any kind of damage without just compensation. So, you know, promising sign. The ultimate determination of whether government conduct constitutes a taking or damage is question for law. A party may seek compensation under the damages clause of the South Dakota Constitution via action for an inverse condemnation. An inverse condemnation is an eminent domain proceeding initiated by the property owner rather than that of the person who is doing the condemnation. Our cases have only permitted recovery for damage or devaluation to private property when the government action with respect to the property has been undertaken for public use. The court has denied compensation when the state action complained of is labeled as a manifestation of the police power. Uh-oh. No return of the property nor compensation is allowed where the state establishes that its actions were done under police power, such as to abate a nuisance. So, yeah, if this was done for police power, then you don't get any compensation. Also, your insurance company won't pay for it. So, you know, you're just out of luck. So that's all super great. The Hammonds acknowledge that law enforcement actions in arresting Gary involve a police power function, but they argue that law enforcement exceeded the legitimate exercise of police power by unreasonably damaging their mobile home. The sheriff responds that the issue is not the reasonableness of the conduct, but whether the conduct constitutes a taking of property for public use or action to preserve the safe, healthy, and general welfare of the public that would be authorized by police power. We have not previously considered whether actions of law enforcement in damaging private property while apprehending a fleeing felon may, under any circumstance, create a right of first impression. When reviewing an issue of first impression, we must consider decisions, or we may consider decisions from other jurisdictions. Okay, so the South Dakota Supreme Court has never had this particular question before under its own state law. And South Dakota is the master of its own state law. So South Dakota has never particularly considered this circumstance. They have talked about the police power and said there's no, there's no um, remedy if the police are exercising police power, but they have never answered the question as to whether it's possible under any set of circumstance for the police to go too far in such a way that would create a right of compensation. So maybe they, maybe it's possible for them to do something that is not necessary in some way, and that might be compensatable even if what they would do otherwise is, is not compensatable. So they never consider the question of, is it possible for the police to go too far? All right, let's consider that question by looking at other states and what they do. The California Supreme Court has denied claims under damages provision of the California Constitution when a store owner filed an inverse condemnation action for property damage caused by law enforcement in apprehending a felony suspect. So California says, no, the, the, the police cannot go too far. The Oklahoma Supreme Court denied damages for claims under the Oklahoma Constitution after law enforcement damaged an apartment unit while executing a search warrant. So Oklahoma says, no, the police can't go too far. The Washington Supreme Court denied a claim for damages under the Washington Constitution after a home was substantially damaged during the execution of a criminal search warrant. So Washington says, no, it is not possible for the police to go too far. However, there is law to the contrary. In Iowa, the Iowa Supreme Court held in Kelly versus Story County that property owner may, in limited circumstances, seek compensation as taking under the Iowa Constitution when law enforcement officers damage private property. The court determined in Iowa that the point at which police power becomes so oppressive that results in taking is determined on a case-by-case -case basis and the applicable test essentially one of reasonableness. So Iowa says, yes, it is possible under some circumstance for the police to go too far. So Iowa disagrees as it has the right to do because again, state law. Iowa is the master of its law. California is the master of its law. California says no, Iowa says yes. These are perfectly fine. At least two states have allowed recovery via eminent domain for property damage caused by law enforcement. In Wagner, the Minnesota Supreme Court upheld the right of a homeowner to seek compensation under the Minnesota Constitution when police damaged her property when apprehending a suspect. So Minnesota goes with yes, and in fact, 
more yes generally. So not just it's possible to go too far, but you can seek damages in more situations. And perhaps somewhat surprisingly, or not depending, I guess, on your views, my new home state of Texas says yes, you can seek damages. So California says no, get bent. Get bent if the police destroy your home. Texas says yes, you can sue the police if the police destroy your home. Why does this sound like the opposite of what it should, what you would expect? California is saying no, if the police damage your home, you're, you're shit out of luck. Texas is saying yes, you can sue. But Texas says yes. Okay, great. So in Steele versus City of Houston, the Texas Supreme Court determined that a right of compensation exists under the Texas Constitution for a property owner whose property is damaged by law enforcement when apprehending three suspects. You can sue if you're in Texas. Texas looks better and better with every passing moment. Rejecting the city's claim that it was exercising police power, Steele broadly held and defined public use to include any intentional destruction of property by a governmental entity, including any real or supposed public emergency to apprehend an armed and dangerous man who had taken refuge in the house. Wow. So uh, if you were if you were to guess which state went the furthest in saying you can sue the police, the state that went the furthest was Texas. You know, eh, that's, you know, there you go. Lone, Lone Star says you can sue. Even in a real emergency, you can sue. Fun. After reviewing the language of the article of the South Dakota Constitution and the decisions from this other jurisdiction, we join the courts that have said no. We're more comfortable with the no answer. Okay. So South Dakota says no. You'd think they'd be more likely to go with Texas. South Dakota and Texas seem like brothers in arms, but they said South Dakota says we want to be like California. All right. So we've joined the courts and said no when the damage results from law enforcement, when private property in result of pursuing a fleeing felon. South Dakota doesn't love you as much as Texas. Courts which have denied compensation under similar eminent domain provisions of their state constitution have properly applied the framework established by their constitution then that a taking or damage arises from a public use function rather than a police power function. I don't like this language very much. There's something about this that's fundamentally wrong uh, because they, this every state is the master of its own state law. So they say courts that have denied compensation have properly applied the framework difference between public use and police power. But what a condescending thing to say. This is this is law splaining. This is law splaining. The South Dakota Supreme Court is law splaining apparently to Texas and saying, well, the states that agree with us have properly applied the framework. Um, I, I don't know how to explain this to South Dakota in easier to understand words, but it is not possible for other states to misapply the framework either way. You, you are properly applying the framework if you say you are, and so is Texas. So there's something very condescending and, and law explaining about this was well, like, well, if you properly understood the distinction between police power and public use, you'd come up the same way as us. And Texas, Texas Supreme Court's over here like, what are we, chopped liver? We, we say that this is public use. You can't say we're wrong. We're the state Supreme Court. What is this madness? I don't know, man. South Dakota's not having it for some reason. Finally, there is no language in the state constitution to support the argument that unreasonable use of police power is compensatable under the eminent domain section, even though it says damage. Okay. While the article abrogates sovereign immunity for cases involving public use function, public entities are free from liability for tort unless waived by legislation. This court may not waive sovereign immunity against the state in the absence of legislative authority to do so, which sounds like they did, but apparently not somehow. Therefore, the claim for inverse condemnation should have been dismissed on summary judgment. Okay, I guess, I mean, if you say so. So having discussed the state level law, we now must also decide the federal law because there was this 1983 claim. So can we sue under 1983? You already know the answer to this question, but let's discuss it anyway. The Civil Rights Act of 1871 codified at 42 USC 1983 creates a civil cause of action for deprivation of constitutional rights. To establish a cause of action, a plaintiff must prove that a person has deprived him of a federal right. 
and also that's well established and so forth and so on. It is well established that searches and seizures inside a home without a warrant are presumptively unreasonable. Exigent circumstances will justify a warrantless entry into a home for purposes of either arrest or search when there is an emergency, a situation demanding immediate attention with no time to obtain a warrant. We conclude at a minimum that Sheriff's warrantless entry into the mobile home required an objectively reasonable belief that Gary was living in present at the home at the time of the entry. The question of whether warrantless entry was supported by objectively reasonable belief that Gary was living in the home as a question of law for the circuit of the court. Whether he had an objectively reasonable belief, I mean, that seems more factual, but okay, I guess it's a question of law somehow. I guess the ultimate question of the reasonableness is, but yeah. Undisputed facts in the existing record show that Sheriff knew that Hammonds allowed Gary to stay at the mobile home when he was not working, and Gary was present at the home at the time law enforcement first arrived. These facts support a reasonable belief that Gary was present in the home. However, disputed facts exist concerning Gary's whereabout after the initial contact. The sheriff initially saw Gary exit and re-enter the home shortly after he arrived. Later, after law enforcement had established a perimeter, there were at least two reported sightings of Gary outside the home. The Hammonds also point to radio traffic from law enforcement that suggested law enforcement did not believe he was inside the home and the mobile home had been cleared. If the court concludes the sheriff did not have an objectively reasonable belief that Gary was present in the mobile home at the time of entry, then the arrest warrant did not give law enforcement authority to enter the home to search for him. In that event, law enforcement could not enter the home without a search warrant absent exigent circumstances. Because the sheriff did not obtain a search warrant, we review whether he has identified undisputed facts in the record showing exigency. Okay. Oh, yeah. Exigent circumstances to enter a home exist when law enforcement reasonably believes delay in procuring a search would gravely endanger life, risk destruction of evidence, or greatly enhance the likelihood of escape. Given that law enforcement's last contact with Gary suggested he was no longer in the home, coupled with the fact that law enforcement has surrounded the mobile home for several hours without incident or materialized threat from Gary, we cannot determine as a matter of law that exigent circumstances existed at the time the sheriff decided to enter the mobile home. In the event that entry into the home is ultimately determined to be lawful, then there is an alternative claim that whether excessive force was used must be addressed. The sheriff challenges the court's denial of motion for summary judgment on the excessive force claim, while Hammonds argue that fact questions exist on whether the sheriff used excessive force to enter the home. Regardless of whether the sheriff used excessive force, the Hammonds cannot prevail because they cannot show the sheriff used force, even if it was excessive, violated an established right. In United States v. Ramirez, the court recognized that excessive or unnecessary destruction of property in the course of a search may violate the Fourth Amendment even though the entry itself is lawful and the fruits of the search are not subject to suppression. Ramirez does not provide guidance for determining whether the destruction of the property was excessive here. Recently, in discussing these clearly established prong for qualified immunity, the Supreme Court expounded that use of force in an area of law which resulted depends very much on the facts of the case and thus police officers are entitled to qualified immunity unless existing precedent squarely governs the facts at issue. The Hammonds have not presented authority that clearly establishes the force used to enter the home under circumstance presence was unreasonable under the Fourth Amendment, which, you know, yeah. In the absence of excessive force under similar circumstance, the sheriff is entitled to dismissal based on qualified immunity. Yeah, we all knew that was going to be the end conclusion at the end, so yeah. Thus, that brings us to the end of the discussion of Gareth Hammond versus Hamlin County. In this case, the police were looking after Gareth's son, Gary, and they went to a mobile home where he was at the time, and he left at some period, and he re-entered at some period, and there's some question as to where his whereabouts were. There were some eyewitnesses who saw him running through the woods, but then again, the sheriff did see him exiting and re-entering, so maybe he re-entered or something. I don't know. But the police decide basically to destroy the home. They used an armored vehicle to punch a hole in the door, which I'm sure was very effective. Mobile home and armored tank, yeah. And the, the court rules first under the state constitution, despite law to the contrary, which would suggest the opposite. Um, no, you, you don't get compensation, and states that believe otherwise don't understand the split between police power and public use. What? Anyway, and yeah, 
and and also you can't sue under 1983 because it wasn't clearly established based on these circumstances. So you lose, you're, eight, you're out $19,000, and that brings us to the end of the discussion of this case.